Guys, I want you to look at this person over here. You see him? His name is Soko. See that hair? Good. Beautiful. Right? Gorgeous. This guy, instead, that's singed. Hair? None. Bald. Bald. Bald? And is he a villain? You know he's a villain because he's bald. That's why you need my sponsor today, Keeps. Did you know that two out of three men will experience some kind of male pattern baldness? See Singe there? He is one of those two out of three men. Silco, he was the other one, but he decided to go with Keeps because he was preventative and he didn't wait too long. Singe is a villain because he's icky. No hair. Silco, however, a villain? Maybe. But that hair? Fantastic. Singed has nothing to do with the chemical explosion. He's just icky. Luckily, Soko decided to check out the link in the description to go ahead and get a percentage off. Soko may be a villain, but he's a smart man. And smart men get keeps. Thank you for sponsoring this video. Check out the description and let's get on with Trauma Simulator 2020. One, 20. When this come out? Hello everybody, my name is Bricky, currently fleeing Twitter because I said Caitlyn was boring. I wanted to call myself being fashionably late to this review. I'm not, I'm just late. Though there is a benefit to being late. When something comes out and the hype is circulating, emotions are high, excitement is high, and that could kind of play in your overall thoughts on the product. Arcane was one of those that I really wanted to digest. One, because I don't want to draw the eyes of the league community too hard as they are one of the most toxic YouTube communities out there. I still get comments on my So You Wanna Main videos about why my build is bad. Why my build is bad. For videos four years old. And also, this is kind of an unprecedented time. This is not only a TV show from a video game, but one of the highest budgeted ones out there and completely animated. Sure, we have The Witcher and, I mean, Castlevania is pretty stellar, but this one was was different. It's not a story game. It's a MOBA. Like, sure, there's lore, but there wasn't a campaign. So I watched it back when it came out, three acts with three episodes each week. And when I finally finished the entire thing, I thought it was pretty magnificent. My consistent reaction was, why is this so good? This has no right to be this good. Video game adaptation, this animation, first time creating this kind of thing for the studio. It had no right to be as good as it was, yet it was consistent consistently, consistently exceeding my expectations. I thought it was incredible. A masterpiece? No, not quite, but fantastic. With time, my thoughts began to marinate a little bit in my brain juices, and I kind of was a little bit harder on it. Once the hype died down, I kind of started to get a little bit more rough on some of the parts I didn't like so much in the actual story. Some tropes I didn't enjoy, a couple story things I didn't like, and a few issues that I had with it originally started to kind of creep their way up. So I thought, okay, if I truly want to talk about this show, I need to rip into it. Overall, I really like this show quite a bit, but this is going to be an overly critical review of Arcane. I am going to tear through this show in both its good and bad aspects, and I am holding nothing back. So if you're the kind of person who gets generally pretty upset when someone else doesn't like the show you like, one, seek therapy, and two, Leave. Also leave if you don't want spoilers, because I will be spoiling the entirety of the show. When I rewatched it, I took notes on every episode, and I will be going through each and every one of those notes through this video. Spoilers done, crazy's gone, I hope. Let's go into episode one. Road work ahead? Uh, yeah, I sure hope it does. Episode one, when starting teen rated League of Legends, hee hee, Teemo war criminal kind of stuff, I didn't expect to start on two girls being orphaned. <laughs> I did not expect this opening whatsoever. Wow. Wow, does it start hard. Which then is immediately superset by Imagine Dragons, which I must say, I, I don't dislike Imagine Dragons. You know, obviously Riot likes them a lot because they've been playing League since like season two or something. That's why they keep making music for them. I don't dislike their songs or anything, but I don't think this is a very good choice for the intro song, especially when you immediately slam from orphaning children to enemy by Imagine Dragons. It just, it doesn't quite fit. The animation of the show especially has some incredible weight to it. This whole show shows that off very well. Everything has the 
proper weight. The sound, the feel, especially this is shown right in this part where Clagger jumps from the roof and it has that really loud thud. You can really feel the weight of the characters and objects around the world. It's a great part. The initial fight with the kids, I think, really sets the stage for the show. It's far bloodier than I expected. It has that same weight to it, and all the characters have their fighting style. Vi has the boxing thing. Clagger really uses his weight to his advantage. There's a part in this fight that I really want to highlight because I think it's actually just really indicative of the style the show is going for. Powder is in slow-mo time and basically everyone's punching and she's kind of starting that little trauma like, oh my God, look what's happening. And she gets up with the bag of stuff to bail. Now in most other shows and movies and stuff, she would just leave and then they would cut to her running away, whatever. But as she gets up to run away, it's like the shows wanted to remind you like, yeah, this fight doesn't just stop because the scene is changing. It's still going on. And immediately, Immediately when she gets up, two people slam into the wall right next to her. It's this really tiny little detail that I just love. You could have easily saved the amount of hours, time, money, etc., by not animating that and having just her just run away. But they decide to add that little bit into it to make the danger feel that much more real and really make her feel like a kid stuck in a situation she is woefully unprepared for. Really good. This happens a lot in the show. That being said, Powder, you dumb bitch. I get it. But Powder, you dumb bitch. Zon reveal. The music option here, much better. Great montage. I originally was annoyed with the typical bartender is the bro guy that everyone has their back for because he's the guy who pours the drinks trope. It's it's quite a commonly used trope, but I think he's voiced by the same guy who does Blisk in Titanfall. And I mean, you know me, I, I can't like... Nice. Good choice. I love that VA. Powder is overhearing Milo and Vi talk about her, and they almost did the overheard trope and overheard incorrectly, but it literally ends, I think, the same episode. So, fine. It was very quick and it was gone. Thank God. It was like a bait and switch. I really like Grayson in this show. I just really enjoy her character. Now, is it because she is plays Admiral Shalaran Vastombe in Mass Effect? Maybe. But she's a really good voice actress, so fuck you. Silco's entrance in the show is also really fantastic. His just opening, great. Great singe stuff there, too. It's kind of funny because you don't really think it's singed, but now that you know it's him rewatching it, adds a little bit to it. Honestly, episode one, I almost have no problems with it. I, it's almost a flawless episode, in my opinion. It's not my favorite episode, but I have very few negatives for it. And it's not the best pilot in the world, but it's a really good opener. Episode two. <laughs> Again, with the animation, oh my god, the mage using his powers and stuff is just heaven. The time it must have taken to animate that, and yet they, they did it. It's so good. We get an introduction to Jace as a character who is mostly uninteresting in Act 1, but, you know, he has his moments. I like the setup for Vi and Jinx as they're trying to lay low. Vi is punching the machine and Jinx is shooting stuff. It kind of shows off their skills to be reutilized later. I really like the council member design. Not only does it have a lot of diversity in characters in, in both, like, ethnic diversity and all that, but just some of the things they wear, like the giant coats or that creepy, like, clock work device around that lady with the long golden fingernails like there's a lot of great design even mel has even though she's like more of the more subdued ones of all the council members just the little things like the gold flakes under her eyes and stuff like she looks fucking dope they all look dope even the silly one also setups and payoffs again mel using the little child's toy to mess with the one guy to get jace off solid i really like marcus i mean he's a prick don't get me wrong his character is that way but i really like his character i don't know what it is about him maybe it's the way he carries himself maybe it's that holier than thou kind of vibe he has or perhaps it's his voice actor but whatever the reason is i really like marcus as a character i also love how the enforcer that went to go search the room underneath the bar really tried the only place he didn't look was up he went under the bed he went all around behind things like he thoroughly searched that place besides up and even as he was leaving he was kind of like being really cautious about it like kind of taking his long time to close it it felt like an actual search which is a lot better than those other movies that just kind of look around no one here and then just leave it, it added good tension actually this is a great segue to the discussion of the enforcers and their, their design as a whole the idea to give these enforcers like rebreather masks was 
absolutely genius. Not only is their getup really cool, and it kind of gives them this like stormtrooper looking vibe, but in the Piltover way, but their breather masks serves three purposes, and it's magnificent. One, it makes them incredibly intimidating, just having the constant breathing in the masks, like making them seem like stormtroopers or any enemy, you know, someone who is very foreign to this environment. Two, it serves a practical purpose where the air is so much thicker down below, and even though they can breathe with the mask off, they choose to wear it regardless, you know, the intimidation factor and to separate themselves from all the Zonites. And three, it also helps reinforce the classism part of it. The people from Topside literally do not want to breathe the Undercity's air. They deem themselves better than to breathe the Undercity's air. It's just such a genius design decision that serves every purpose it needs to and then some. Fucking magnificent. Love it. Episode three. Oh boy, here we go. You know, I really hate children. Soko's backstory in the beginning here was really good. I love the setup to be paying off at the end of the episode, of course. Rip Grayson. Gone way too soon, man. I really liked Grayson. Come on. Though it does serve to make Marcus a better character due to his reaction for it, you know? You can see he's legitimately angry about how this has turned out, considering his deal. Also, I haven't mentioned it much yet. The cinematography for this show is astounding. Just simple things like the blood splatter hitting the window of the basement and therefore casting a red hue over Vi. Just Ah, oh, so smart, so good. Vander says, I had no choice. Soko says, perhaps. I like that a lot. Often you'll hear some kind of like, oh, we all have a choice. You could have made different choice. Like, Soko kind of has this like, yeah, maybe. It's a very interesting thing where two people kind of had a similar ideology and it's got kind of pulled in different directions due to circumstance. It makes Soko seem like a much more reasonable guy despite being the main villain. I really like the part where Victor is pretending to not know what he's doing on the spot when he's trying to open the door. It's like, this isn't in my bedroom. I, I don't know, it's just fun. Okay, this crying, like sobbing tantrum that Powder does here is the best crying thing I have ever seen animated in my life, in anything. It is the most realistic. It is kind of harrowing. It's a little bit uncomfortable. It is the most realistic crying fit I have ever seen. Ever. There's a meme on my stream, twitch.tv slash bricky, about how much I hate kids. And, and I do. Oh, child. Especially when they're screaming. Any kind of screaming, screeching, crying of kids, it's like nails on chalkboard for me. Whenever I hear kids screeching or yelling in movies or TV shows or whatever, I understand why it's there and maybe it's important for the story. I always wanted to just stop. One of the only Miyazaki films I dislike is Ponyo because I find the little girl Ponyo really fucking annoying. This is the only time I've watched a kid cry and not been annoyed because I was so impressed by the voice acting, the animation, and how realistic it was. Bravo, you made me not hate a crying kid. That's a feat. Okay, so I really don't think Vi can take out all these henchmen at her age, but it's a really cool scene, so I'll give it a pass. Wait a wait a fucking second. Yo, skater, ed editor man. I wanna die. When she's climbing up the, the fucking thing, did you hear the Roblox oof sound effect? <laughs> or am I crazy? <laughs> Vander's finale is is incredible. It's so well done. It brings in the spirit of like tragedy. It's very sad. It's got a lot of weight to it. You know, he's putting the thing back on, so to speak. It's really sad, but also heroic at the same time. And it ends with the whole Soko stabbing him, incorporating his backstory shown in the beginning of the episode. It's so good. It actually makes me kind of sad that he's probably going to be Warwick because I really feel like that lessens. Uh, you know me, I love myself some tragedy porn. I love Arcane. Kind of tragic, what did you say? Maybe, I feel like that's almost a little too far, having him be Warwick or something. I, I don't, I don't think he deserves that. However, yeah, I did not expect the ending of this episode, the first time I saw it. Oh my God. Again, great tantrum, great crying, great voice acting by Powder's VA, a great reveal for Vi's name. We never really knew her name. So it's an interesting reveal if you don't play League, but it's an even crazier reveal if you do play League. It serves both functions. Just a really good episode. Act one really is trauma simulator, isn't it? It's quite good. I'd say it's the strongest of the three acts, but it also doesn't have my favorite parts. The My favorite parts generally come in the last act, but there's a few more issues I have with act two and three, but overall act one, 
It's a neat package. I'd say the strongest ha has some really good moments, really sad moments, very few flaws. It's good. Very good. Episode four. Yo, do a kickflip. Oh, it's a race. Who's got it? Holy shit. I didn't realize that they set up the exploding fireflies on progress day. I, I didn't know they set that up. Oh my God. Setups and payoffs is literally screenwriting 101, but when they're used so much and so well, it makes me, it makes me happy. It makes me very happy. Also, how many years have passed? Is it ever mentioned? How many years have gone by? I always thought it was like five to 10, uh, maybe not 10, maybe like five years, give or take. I don't quite know exactly how long. I'm gonna go with five. I don't know if they mentioned it in the show. Also the firelight scenes are fucking great. Some of the best animation I have ever seen. Some of the best fight scenes I have ever seen. They're fast, fluid, impressive to look at. Just the firelight stuff. G give me more of that in season two. Please give me more of that in season two. Also the use of loud classical music during the reveal of Jinx and her going crazy. Good choice. Very, very good choice. Also, wow, she shot that girl dead. I never really noticed this physical change, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, Jace got kind of built. He got pretty buff and Victor got slimmer. He, he got weaker. Not only are they changing in the time, terms of their personalities, but they are literally changing physically. I also really like Victor's fear of waiting. You know, Heimerdinger is the guy who lives, which by the way, I like the donger in this show. He's pretty good, but he's constantly wanting to wait and wait and wait, uh, test, test, test. And Victor's like, I will literally be dead by the time we get anything going. And it's a really fair and understandable thing for him to be so worried about. Like he is, dying and he's like no we gotta wait longer safeguards 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 like no i'm on victor's side here yo go crazy once again i like marcus he is the problem here don't get me wrong but i like his character i really like this framing device here where jace puts the cup in front of victor like perfectly in frame just, just really good i'm also really glad silko and jinx's relationship is father daughter because sometimes it feels really sus i'm, I'm glad it's not also great intro for vi really like that episode five Man, I miss Grayson. She was gone way too soon. Uh, I like the scene setting up Caitlyn a little bit, you know, giving her a little bit of her backstory, but it just shows more Grayson, which makes me miss Grayson more. Also, this show just has some incredible transitions overall. Transitions, just, they're so good. Okay, here's one of the problems I have with Arcane in general, and it's one of the bigger issues I have. They expect me as an audience member to have watched Act 3 and then wait the week for the next act, right? So I guess they assume that maybe in only a week, I have completely forgotten why Jinx is the way she is. So whenever she has a manic episode, they constantly flash back to the reason why she's crazy. Like, Assuming I didn't just watch this? A week is not that long. I can remember what happened with Jinx. And especially if I try to watch this in, say, a couple of days, you know, because it's not that long, or if I want to binge it. Well, I literally saw this two hours ago. If you want to flash back to something, say, in season one when you're in season two, fine, but not two episodes later. A lot of flashbacking when Jinx is going through romantic episodes, and I think it's kind of annoying, and I feel like I'm being talked down to as an audience member, like, oh, it's okay, dummy. Here, we'll remind you. It's okay, pops. We'll get you to your room. I like Fishman. I want more Fishman. When I first saw this scene, I thought the musician might have actually been Jin, because Jin comes from Ionia, which is the fictional area of Asian descent, so to speak, you know? So he had that demographic, and he's really good at his artistry and all that, but then I realized that he was actually uh, a famous musician that had a cameo, which is cool, don't get me wrong, but I, I thought there was a little Jin hint there. There was not. That being said, you know what's not cool? Jinx shooting this bird. That ain't cool. And then we're hit with more flashbacks. Again. Fuck, man. Mel is playing Jace more than I played him in season three. Gimp. Yordle. Bottom text. Oh boy, this part. I've been saving some energy for this part. So Arcane covers a lot of issues, right? Classism, fear of invention, family bonds, effects of trauma, political infighting, political corruption. And then the show ends and I go on the internet to discuss and the only thing I see is, oh my God, they're gay! Caitlin and Vi are gay! Confirmed! The gauntlets aren't just gonna be used for punching! Turns out Kate is attracted not just to women, but also Yasuo mains because 
because they got a fat ass butt. I probably can't put that in the video. And I, I get it. No, I actually am really pleased with the representation. I think it's super cool that we have a main character that is, well, I guess we don't know if she swings both ways or not, but you get the point. Like the main character in a big budget production like this in a show that has a ton of diversity already and really championing that is just, it's great. I love that. But it's a little bit annoying to me when I go online and I say, and I quote, everyone simping over Vi Caitlyn when Victor is easily the most interesting part of Arcane for me. And half my replies are why I have no right speaking on the gay characters. I just like Victor. I think he's cool. <laughs> Hello, my name is Berkey, and I come to you with a public service announcement. Creating an online profile entirely dedicated to standing, quote unquote, or shipping characters that are fictional, aka not real, and then getting upset on said not real character's behalf is not a replacement for a personality. And I would suggest you work on yours. Unless, of course, you are a rioter, like this rioter, who responded to the very tweet I mentioned before with one word, based. Nice. Okay, back on track. Quote, I can't do it. Just give it to the doctor. Man, could you imagine if they just gave a Hextech crystal to fucking Singed? Oh my god. The war crimes. I find it hilarious that Victor gives Sky the exact same treatment I gave Ashley in Mass Effect, considering that they share the exact same voice actors. I can't believe sex is canon in League of Legends. And like with the brothel part, they did it tastefully. League of Legends did sex, something that League of Legends has never even heard of, tastefully. And then right after that, they make Imagine Dragons canon in League of Legends. I'm having a fucking fever dream. Again, these transitions right here, amazing. Also, Savika is a really dope character. I hope she sticks around. Episode six. Piece of shit. Fresh. Uh -oh. Ding dong dick. Victor's little origin story is quite sweet. I also really like Singed's VA. He doesn't do much in the show, but he's got a great VA. I really like that despite Jace being propped up in this political environment, he never really turns his back on Victor. He's always talking about him as friends and partners, and he's always like, we do this together. He never truly forsakes Victor like I kind of thought he would with time. No, he's just got his own shit to deal with. This is the only part of Soko I don't like. It's super like maniacal, evil <laughs> guy, especially destroying the house of cards. Like, come on now. Caitlyn here is the best example I can give for my problem with her character. She's the young rich girl who doesn't want to be doing the young rich girl things and wants to be down in the dirt doing her own thing. The very Rose from Titanic kind of thing. It's a trope I've seen a lot of and a trope I'm getting a little tired of. She doesn't feel like she really does much in this season. She's mainly just there to either say exposition or try to reinforce the classism point a lot and a lot more heavy handed. In fact, Caitlyn doesn't feel like a great character on her own in this show. Actually, I feel like her main purpose is to make Vi a better character. She's like an extension, a, a, a prop up for Vi, as opposed to being a great character herself. She's a bit of a deadpan and often she'll just spout this like, oh, I didn't know it was so bad down here. And then so Someone else will be like, yeah, you topsiders and your fancy cocks and your golden crested cum. They do that a lot. On the flip side, Donger is an absolute treat in the show. Why is Heimerdinger so great in the show? See, he's very boomer, right? He has his own situation. He's very resistant to change, but you, you understand why? You can't really fault him for thinking the way he does, but you don't agree with him at all. That being said, what Jace does to Donger, I will never forgive him for. That part right there is so fucking sad. Ooh, speaking of fuckery, I can't believe the word fuck is canon in League of Legends. The ending of this episode is outstanding. One of the best endings of any of the episodes. The music choice is incredible. I love Soko's like kind of tantrum, so to speak, his anger tantrum. I really enjoy the firelight fights and ugh. It's actually the, all the enforcers putting up the blocks and Marcus kind of standing there in frame. It's just, it is so good. Probably the best ending of any of the episodes. I absolutely adore it. And like I said, I need more firelight stuff in season two. It's so good. Episode seven. Look at all those chickens. I want to talk about Echo a little bit. 
I really like his involvement in this story. It, little baby Echo is adorable, but Big Echo, I, I like him. I just, I feel like he falls in the same trap Caitlyn does sometime. He's the anathema to Caitlyn, right? She's constantly just surprised, like, oh my God, I was such a rich top cider girl, and now I'm seeing the underbellies, and wow, it's so much worse than I thought. And Echo's there saying, yeah, no shit, it's worse than you thought, you fucking moron, you never come down here. I've been scrounging in the streets trying to survive, and I'm like, okay. Echo, I get it. Now you're doing the opposite thing. Now you're the heavy-handed classism. Which is too bad, because I think Echo overall is a better developed character than Caitlyn is. However, he does fall in that trap of spouting heavy-handed classism statements. I'm like, okay, I get what you're saying. I got it. That being said, I love his age up. I think Echo in the old League stuff and the splash arts, he looks like a couple years younger give or take, and he he looks like he's a late teens, maybe maybe even, maybe even like, like 19 perhaps, which I guess is late teens, shut up. I really like his age up, he looks tougher, he looks stronger, his firelight get up with the mask, he looks so sick. All right, I wanna talk about Jace. Originally, Jace, way back in season two when he came out, I was there for his, his release, he was just kind of like the Iron Man character. Basically, he was a really smart inventor, really smug, kind of an asshole. He actually, I think, told a kid to like piss off in one of his stories, which is really funny considering this show now, but you know. When I first watched the show, I thought Jace was gonna be nothing special because Jace never was something special. And when I watched it, I actually ended up liking Jace more than I thought, but then when I watch it again, I think I appreciate him even more. It's really engrossing to see him be slowly corrupted and consumed by the political environment he was so against originally. His mind is being taken apart bit by bit by this like oligarchy, this aristocratic oligarchy. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't government. Certain situations, like in the next episode, in episode eight, he sees like the strewn amount of bodies of enforcers and he throws up over the bridge and he's like oh my god i need to do something I, I don't know how i would react in his position at all it's a really genuine descent and i i really like it ow 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 needles in spots they're not supposed to be in i mm, don't like that this part bugs me again underneath the tree caitlin echo shouting at each other classism dialogue very heavy-handed like I, I mentioned this many times already I'm fine with the classes a message. It's a good message. I like it, but it's just sometimes a little bit too ham fisted. Subtlety, like I mentioned before with the rebreathers, you know, really subtle thing there for that. Like, oh, great. This one, they're literally saying Think, things are tough for us down here. You wouldn't get it. All right. Episode seven had a lot to talk about, but it's time we talk about my main man, Victor. Victor was such a standout in this show. One I never expected him to. To be because Victor, back when he came out, way back when, you know, he was maniacal Russian robot man. And then in Legends of Ruterra, he's still maniacal Russian robot man. And so when I see this little soft spoken, calm cripple in the show, I think that's fucking Victor? How? When? Why? And like I said, I love me some tragedy porn. And this right here. Like, Victor's situation, just wait a while, wait a while. It needs more time. It needs more improvements. He's a man who just wanted to help people and possibly help himself. And he's constantly being told, wait, 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 despite the fact that he is dying. I don't blame him for doing a single thing. I don't know what it would be like in his position. I don't know what it would be like to be face to face with your own mortality and being told, wait. He is living on borrowed time and it's so heartbreaking and sad, but at the same time, just so much more interesting because that growth, that change, because even so at the moment right now, even at the end of the show, he's not Victor we know. He's not even emotionally Victor we know. He's still young, sad, super depressed Victor. And I am so interested to see where he's gonna go. I think Victor absolutely steals the show in every scene he's in, and he is a underrated standout and the best written and the best designed character in the entire show. Well, maybe not designed, like visually, but the best written character in the show. On the flip side, damn it, Marcus. Marcus had a really generic role, you know, corrupt cop, but I liked him. And he had to be stupid. And his death was so unceremonious. It was just like, bleh, which I guess there's a point to that, but come on, Marcus. Okay, Jinx versus Echo fight scene. This is the best scene of the entire show. 
and I still have two problems with it. Even so, oh my god. It is so well shot, great music choice, great lack of music. So not only do you get a little bit more Echo versus Jinx with his board and everything, so some even better Firelight animation again, but then you get the little, little pocket watch thing, which is a great call to the Echo that we know, and the music choice is just fantastic. The only big problem here is that it was not set up. And for a show with so many incredible setups and payoffs, this is one of the ones that was not set up and it's pretty disappointing to me. All you needed was some characters talking, doing something in the first act and having the two of them playing that game in the background. You don't even need to call attention to it. Just have them do it in the back. My second problem with it is the plot armor. Jinx, Echo, they're both champions. I don't think they're gonna die and they don't. That being said, after the little song plays, the timer ticks, and then the music goes from loud and very in your face to dead silent. Just the young kids, music swelling, and then nothing. Just the sound of the gunfire, the running, and the grunting. And it's so visceral, so exciting, so tense. And oh my God, does Echo beat the shit out of her. Now, it's not how I think the scene should have ended. It should have ended a little bit more like this. <laughs> but while I hate the whole he hesitated trope, it's fine and it still makes for the best scene in the whole goddamn show. It's so fucking good. Episode eight. I sure hope no nine foot six tall vampire lady comes and pegs me. Ooh. I like Mel's backstory. War is the failure of statecraft. Also, it set up Noxus as a region, I think also really well. Singe shows more excitement, torturing Jinx and fixing her condition than he does in the entire show. You want to give that man a Hextech crystal, Jesus Christ. Also, he mentioned having a daughter, which he actually looks at in a little locket at the end of the show. Interesting. God damn, Mel's mom is gigantic. Weapons cannot be unmade and they are always used. Pretty good, good, good quote, especially from a Noxian. God, I wish that was me. Little Donger having his reality check is both like kind of sad, but also kind of adorable. He's so small. Quote. What about us? What about you? This is only one of those things that was really weird. When were you together? Or did you become boyfriend and girlfriend? When you spent a night together in a bed and survived goons attacking you? It's been like a day. What about you? Oil and water, oil and water, not even, you weren't even two liquids. It was oil and rock. You weren't even the same solid state. Suddenly you're in a relationship? Where did that come from? Sky looks a lot like Ashley did when I left her on Vermeer. <laughs> man, that's fucked. Speaking of fucked, man, Victor just can't get a goddamn break, can he? Oh my god. All right, second best scene in the show. Couple tropes here. The guys kill all the henchmen and then stop and brood around the main character trope, which is a little bit annoying. But besides that, oh my god, this scene is so good. I'm glad Jace got to use the hammer. It was great. It looked cool. He definitely swung it kind of weirdly. He didn't swing it like a soldier. He swung it like a scientist, which is, I think is good. Good little attention to detail there. And just Vi's stuff. Oh, it's so good. Also, they mentioned a lot that Vi blocks with her face. I'm no boxing expert. I mean, I do boxing every week, but I'm not like a, a know-it-all on that thing. But it does seem like Vi constantly faces people like this, which leaves her whole thing open instead of having like the side turns. And if that's the case and that's intentional, that's pretty cool. If it's not intentional, then whatever. But if it is, I was like, oh yeah, she does keep blocked with her face. That's that's smart. Oh, child. child. Nude. Caitlin. Bottom text. Episode 9. Boss, you killed a child. Amazing. Mission complete. That right there is why you're the best, boss. Oh man, Victor's still having a bad time. Mel and her mom's relationship is really interesting. Originally, I was a little eh on Mel. I thought she was just kind of there to play Jace like a like a trumpet. Oh, I forgot to mention that Jace went went down Jace went down on Mel and he was little spoon. What a chad. <laughs> anyway, originally I was a little meh on Mel. Like she felt kind of like how Caitlyn was where she was just there to kind of prop up Jace a bit like how Caitlyn props up Vi. But I think the discussions with her mom really show the difference of mentality between Piltover and Noxus. You know, the difference of, of thinking and the difference of the way of war. It's a lot more interesting 
And I think it adds definitely a, a little bit more of a dynamic to Mel's character. And it makes me actually pretty excited to see more of her in the second season. I really enjoy that Silco legitimately was scared he was going to die with a confrontation with Finn and Savika. If you look closely after, you know, she swings her sword and kills, what's his name, Finn or whatever, he's breathing really heavily. Like he was kind of in this 50-50 state where like, she might actually kill me. You know, I'm rolling a gamble here. It was good. Good little details. Also, the Savika versus Vi fight, fucking fantastic. Great duel. Great, like, Western kind of duel thing. Really, really good. I hope that she sticks around in season two. She's still alive, so she will, I hope, but, but damn, please. Really good. All right, here's the ending bit. Jinx is being Jinx. The problem, Soko died way too early for my liking. He honestly propped up the show so much more, and him dying too this early is just, I don't like that. I really liked him, and I think he went way too soon. There are also many more things that have not been touched on, and it leaves us with a cliffhanger ending that I thoroughly disliked, and it left a really bad taste in my mouth, and it still does. Vi becoming an enforcer is a big part. The entirety of Victor has an, an entire dilemma still going on with his transformation, so to speak. You've got the Singed and the Warwick stuff that's being hinted at, but not quite there, you know? Caitlyn's supposed to become the Sheriff of Piltover, but if I'm not mistaken, her old lore has it where she becomes the sheriff because her parents die, because she's orphaned. And there's a big fucking rocket coming to at least one of her parents. So lots of questions at a cliffhanger that I wasn't pleased to see, despite it having a good music track at the end and all that. So Arcane. Overall, taking these notes was really nice and it really helped me get my statements out. I think it helped me explain my position a little bit better and why certain things crescendo to others. When I first finished the show, I think I gave it like a nine. I don't consider any kind of uh, out of 10 scale to really be worth it. I don't really believe in number ratings, but to actually give you a bit of a ballpark, I gave it around like a nine. And then I thought about it more. And I kind of dropped it to an eight. After watching it again, I give it like an 8.5. My biggest and number one problem with Arcane is plot armor. Now, I don't know what they plan to do with the these characters maybe they'll die maybe they won't but there's a lot of champions in league in this show Singed, maybe warwick echo jinx caitlin vi victor jace heimer there's so many characters and a lot of the tension is deflated when these characters are on screen my first thought is always well they're not going to kill them they're a champion they're fine they're safe now sometimes the scenes can get really good echo versus jinx is the best scene in the show despite me not having that much worry that they're going to die or jace and vi fighting the baron or whatever those dudes were i'm still not worried they're going to die but yeah, sometimes it can be pretty intense. But even besides that, I do think that the tension is deflated quite a bit because of the sheer volume of plot armor. Especially when you look at all the side characters that died. Marcus died, Grayson died, Benzo died, Milo died, Clagger died, Vander died, so to speak. The uh, blonde kid, I forget his name, died. Silco died. Chem Baron guy died. Sky died. Massive amount of side characters all died that were not champions. In fact, the only ones that didn't were like Mel, Savika, council members, a couple others, I think. It crescendos a bit at the end of the show, too. You know, that you've got four people sitting around a dining table with this really intense scene, and three of them are champions, and one of them is Silco. I wonder which is gonna die. Normally, whenever stakes are deflated like this, you normally counteract that by watching the character change and grow. And that's where the intrigue comes in. This is why Victor is so good in this show. Because I'm not scared Victor's gonna die, but Victor as a character is engrossing and I wanna know how the hell he becomes that. Jace's slow corruption is really interesting because it's his personality being adjusted more than, you know, any physical threat to his body. Certain people like Jinx and Caitlyn, I'm a little harder on because Jinx is Jinx. She doesn't really ch change much. This is what she's like in game, you know? Caitlyn, same deal. She doesn't act a whole lot different than she does in game. She's just Caitlyn. Vi has a bit more to go. I want to know how she becomes an enforcer and she becomes a little bit more silly and giddy and a little less dour and depressed, but even so. Which leads me to my last major problem with the show. It's 
really generic. Haves and have nots here. The corrupt cop with the daughter. The rich girl who wants to be in the muck. The rough and gruff prison girl. The two villains on two sides of the coin. And it's super, super generic of a story, which isn't always bad. Like I said, I still think this show is fucking great, but it does leave a little bit to be desired in terms of actually where do you go from here i'm hoping season two takes a bit more effort intrigue with the story and throws a bit more curveballs at me because at the moment it's pretty generic which like i said isn't terrible last of us one is an incredibly generic father-daughter post-apocalyptic story but it's about the characters that hold it up just like arcane the setting the animation, the voice acting, and characters elevate this generally very generic story to something pretty fantastic. And that's Arcane, a really hyper-analyzed, overly critical, harsh review on the show. It's a great fucking show. My second favorite show in all of 2021, right behind Midnight Mass, which is an entirely different show. If you like Arcane, you might like it, but I don't know. That's very different. It is wonderful. It has no right to be as good as it is for all the things going against it. I am thoroughly looking forward to season two. I just hope that the issues I had with it will be ironed out or at least looked at. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Thank you to my wonderful patrons. You guys allow me to make over, over an hour long, I don't know, video of me just talking about a show that will probably get zero money because it will be demonetized by uh, Netflix. So that's why I have the ad on it. Anyway, questions real quick before I go. Opinion on Pop-Tarts. They're fucking great. S'mores is the best flavor. Don't at me. How do you go on living when you know the British exist? Dude, I have no idea. I contemplate death daily. What is your favorite season? My personal favorite is winter. It's just so cozy. I like winter too. In California, we really only have summer and spring. Uh, so I like my slightly colder spring, at least where I live in Cali. Thank you everyone for watching. I will see you in, I don't know, this month again. Bye. Come on. Obviously you're a skater.